Welcome to our first IWCS webinar series presentation event hosted by the International Cable and Connectivity Symposium. I am Ed Fenton, Fenton Group Incorporated, a cable industry advisor working with the IWCS team. Going forward, this webinar series will be conducted monthly on the third Friday of each month, beginning with the next presentation event on Friday, November 20th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern USA time. Each of you will be receiving an announcement for the event a few weeks prior, giving you the opportunity to register. Before we start, please be aware that you have an opportunity to submit questions to the presenter. Please enter your questions by typing them in the Q&A box on the bottom right of your screen. In the interest of time, we will hold all questions until the end of the presentation. We will select as many questions as time permits, and I will ask them to our presenter. However, all of your questions will be collected and provided to the presenter for a direct response if possible. You will also be given the contact points at the end of the webinar for any other questions that you might have. Today, we welcome Wayne Hopkinson, Senior Research Engineer of Comscope, Inc., North Carolina, USA, who will be presenting his paper, Methods of Evaluating Cable Heating for Power Over Ethernet, known as POE, applications. This paper was originally presented at the IWCS 2015 conference in Atlanta, Georgia, in session five. You can find it as paper 5-2 on the archives page at the IWCS.org website. Our presenter, Wayne Hopkinson, is an engineer with Comscope in Claremont, North Carolina. He received his master's in applied mathematics from the University of Washington and his doctorate in electrical engineering from Florida State University. Wayne holds several patents in the field of telecommunications cable design and has authored contributions to TIA, IEC, and IWCS. Wayne, we are pleased to welcome you to present at this IWCS webinar inaugural series event. Thanks, Ed. Welcome, everybody. The title of our paper, as Ed mentioned, is Methods of Evaluating Cable Heating for POE Applications. This first slide is a broad outline of what we hope to cover this afternoon. First, I'd like to talk about what we hope to avoid or not talk about. Next, I'll touch on some fundamentals of cable heating. And last, I'll spend most of the time on what we hope to achieve, which is the development of an efficient method of determining the temperature rise of bundled cables. We hope to show that many measurements can be replaced by only a few carefully chosen measurements, and we'll also consider some of the errors in our measurement method and develop a method of compensating for those errors. So what do we hope to avoid during this presentation? We will avoid any discussion of POE. This may sound peculiar given the title of the paper, but this endeavor is focused on determining the temperature rise of bundle cables used for POE applications and not the POE schemes themselves. By focusing on the temperature rise of the cabling, we will try to avoid the pitfalls of POE schemes and errors such as confusing power delivered to the load with the power dissipated by the cabling. So, some fundamentals of cable heating. Joule's law tells us that when a current passes through a conductor, the conductor heats up. In one of its simplest forms, Joule's law describes the temperature rise in terms of a constant K and the square of the current through the conductor. It is this constant K that we are most concerned with. In the case of cable heating, K is a function of many parameters, including conductor size, bundle size, number of conductors energized, and presence of insulation, among other things. So what we do hope to achieve is an efficient and accurate method of determining the temperature rise of a cable bundle. But why? Standards organizations are developing models to estimate temperature rise. Why shouldn't we just trust the models they put forth? Well, one answer is we want to support that model development process. We hope to provide an efficient and accurate way of gathering data that will be used to prop up the models under development in TIA, Senelec, and elsewhere. A second, maybe more self-serving answer is we want to save time. 
any cable manufacturer will have a significant portfolio of cables to consider. Further, most cable manufacturers are not going to trust the models that are being developed, and specifically that these models apply to their designs. They are going to want to understand their cables and, in turn, the cables offered to their customers. Also consider that it may take as long as 8 to 12 hours to evaluate a single data point corresponding to a single construction, category, safety rating, bundle density, installation method, and PoE scheme. It would take an entire career to carry out these measurements on every combination. So how do we avoid taking way too many measurements? Unfortunately for us, by taking way too many measurements. We started by building a bundle of cable using a single lot of Cat6 U slash UTP cable. We attached fine wire thermocouples to the center cable and progressively built up what amounted to a 91 cable bundle. Our first five data points corresponded to the temperature rise of the 91 cable bundle at a current level of 0 0.25, 0 0.375, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and 1.0 amps when all four pairs or all eight conductors were energized. The plot in the upper left portion of this slide illustrates this data. Next, we re-terminated the same 91 cable bundle and measured the temperature rise when only two pairs were energized. Once the data on the 91 cable bundle was gathered, we removed the outer layer and repeated the process for the underlying 61 cable bundle in four pair energized and two pair energized form. We continued this process for more than 600 hours until we had gathered temperature rise data on four and two pair energized bundles of 91, 61, 37, 19, and finally seven cable bundles when either four or two pairs were energized. So what observations can we make when we consider the four pair energized data? One observation is that if we fit the data for a given bundle size with a Joule's law shaped function, the fit misses the low current or low temperature rise data. This is likely because we are attempting to measure the temperature between the ambient and the center of the bundle, which is nearly the same. Simply put, there's noise in the measurement made at low current levels. So our first recommendation is to carry out temperature rise experiments at high current levels where you're assured more significant temperature differences. Given that our form of Joule's law contains only one unknown, only one data point is needed to determine the value of K for which a given bundle size fully specifies the temperature rise at any current I. We can also consider the temperature rise versus the number of cables in the bundle. At first glance, we might be tempted to use a straight line fit to estimate the relationship between temperature rise and the number of cables. But closer inspection reveals that the linear model is a good fit to high cable count bundles, but misses the data when the number of cables in a bundle are small. If one were to gather temperature rise data on bundles constructed using only a few cables, extrapolation using the linear model would overestimate the temperature rise of high cable count bundles. The linear model breakdown is more clear when we plot the same data on a log linear plot and shows that a better fit is realized using a linear and square root of n term function to describe the relationship between the temperature rise and the number of cables in a bundle. This is a widely accepted relationship used by Senelec and TIA and accommodates the temperature rise for high and low cable count bundles. Now, earlier we mentioned that we took two pair energized data. We, if we gather all the K values for the five two pair energized bundles and all the K values corresponding to the four pair energized bundles and plot these values as ordered pairs, as we have on the left side of the screen, we see that they lie on a straight line with a slope of one half. In other words, the temperature rise of a two-pair energized bundle 
is almost exactly half that of the temperature rise of an equivalent four-pair energized bundle. This gives us our third recommendation, which is to not make unnecessary measurements for two and four-pair energized cable bundles, but rather use the data gathered on M conductor energized bundles to predict the temperature rise of N conductor energized bundles. So how do these recommendations help? Before we try to answer that, let's review the three suggestions we have to this point. First, we said we're going to try to determine K using data recorded at relatively high current levels, where the temperature rise is significant compared to the ambient temperature. Second, we're going to try to use a function of the form used by Senelec and others to relate the temperature rise to the number of cables in a bundle. Third, we're going to try to use the data gathered on M conductor, or in our case, eight conductor energized bundles, to estimate the temperature rise of N conductor, or in this case, two conductor or four conductor energized bundles. To see how these suggestions help, let's pretend that instead of taking all the data shown earlier, we only gathered the temperature rise data for two differently sized bundles at a single current level. Specifically, let's pretend that we only measured the temperature rise for a 37 and 61 cable bundle when one amp was energizing all eight conductors. Those two measurements provide us enough data to determine the constant C1 and C2 required to express temperature rise as a function of the current I in a cable bundle of N cables when M conductors are energized. With this function, we can predict all the data that took so many hours to gather. This plot illustrates the two measured values along with the predicted temperature rises corresponding to the previously measured conditions. We can check our predictions by plotting our measured data on top of the predicted values. With good agreement, we can use our newfound equation obtained using only two measured values to determine the temperature rise of even higher cable count bundles and at any current level. Further, our equation obtained from only two measured values can be used to predict the temperature rise of a two-pair energized bundle. In the end, we use the temperature rise of only two differently sized cable bundles at a single current level to accurately predict data that originally took over 600 hours to gather. Now, to this point, this process and all of our gathered data was performed on free air bundles. Not every cable bundle will exist in free space. Many bundles will be located in conduit. So, does this approach work for cable in conduit? To answer that question, we built a second cable bundle enclosed in a four inch PVC conduit. We prevented any drafts from affecting the measurement using a, what we called a, a low cost breeze barrier but what many will recognize is some grocery bag stuffed in the end. And a less extensive but similar data set was gathered. This time the 37 and 61 cable bundles at a current of 0.75 amps were used to develop the modeling equation. And for the case of cable and conduit, we saw similar agreement between predicted values and those measured using thermocouples. The similarity between predicted and measured data gives us the confidence to predict the temperature rise of other bundle sizes and currents in four-pair and two-pair energized bundles. So we have a way of determining the temperature rise of any size cable bundle at any current energized using any number of pairs by measuring the temperature rise of only two differently sized bundles at a single current level. but there are those that don't trust the data obtained using thermocouples. They'll point out, rightfully so, that it's the conductors in and not the jacket outside of the center cable that are the hottest portion of the bundle. To ensure that the thermocouple data is correct, we need a way to determine the temperature of the conductors and to determine if there is a significant difference between the conductor temperature and that recorded using the thermocouple method. To 
do this, we built a third cable bundle. But before constructing the bundle, we connected the conductors in what would be the center cable in series and outfitted this new composite conductor with low resistance leads. This cable was placed in an oven and the resistance versus oven temperature was mapped. At this point, we've got a relationship between the resistance of the conductors in the center cable and their temperature. We then use this mapped cable as the center cable in a 91 cable bundle. The leads used to evaluate the resistance in the oven now functioned as voltage probes with which we could determine a voltage drop for a given current. The voltage drop and current allowed for us to relate the resistance of the center cable's conductors to their temperature via the earlier generated map. In short, we're now able to measure the temperature of the conductors in the center cable. So what did we find? One of the things we found was that we were getting really good at building and destroying cable bundles. But we also noticed that the temperatures recorded using the change in resistance method were similar to, but consistently higher than those obtained using the thermocouple method. The plot in the lower right is a plot of the temperature obtained using this change in resistance method versus the temperature obtained using thermocouples. Further, if we determine the ratio of the temperatures obtained using the thermocouple method to those obtained using the change in resistance method and plotted those versus the number of cables in a bundle, a linear relationship was evident. In other words, the two methods, while very similar, did demonstrate error, and that error between the two could be expressed as a function of the number of cables in the bundle. To be specific, the error between the two methods in this case was as much as 5% for seven cable bundles and shrunk to as little as 3% for 91 cable bundles. So, in conclusion, we feel pretty good about our ability to manipulate the simplified form of Joule's law to arrive at an expression that is capable of predicting the temperature rise of any size cable bundle at any current level using any combination of energized pairs. We also demonstrated that this approach works for the case of cable bundles in free air or bundles in conduit. We've also demonstrated that the method of determining temperature rise using thermocouples yields similar results to the change in resistance method. And we see that the error between the two methods is a function of the number of cables in the bundle. And that for the case of U slash UTV cable bundles in free space, this error can be as much as 5% for low cable count bundles and reduces to closer to 3% for 91 cable bundles. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and would be happy to answer any questions this presentation may have prompted. Uh, at, at this time, uh, we, we open for any questions from attendees. Uh, we, we have been tracking questions from uh, attendees and have, have not necessarily received anything uh, yet. However, uh, it, if, if there are any questions coming from the panelists, I would encourage you to, to go ahead and, and, and pose a question to Wayne uh, if, if you have one. I'll give that a minute. Okay. Um, uh, Wayne? Thank you very much for presenting this very interesting and important topic today. Uh, I'd like to remind attendees again that this was presented at the IWCS 2015 conference in Atlanta, Georgia, and you can find it as paper 5-2 on the archives page at the IWCS website. Uh, please note contact points being shown on your screen now should you wish to contact uh, Wayne as the IWCS presenter. Each of these IWCS webinar series presentation events are recorded and will be archived on the IWCS.org website. It takes up to two weeks for these to be posted, but they will be available. 
The IWCS webinar series will conduct presentation events on a monthly basis. Going forward, these events will take place on the third Friday of each month at 10.30 a.m. Eastern USA time. Our next scheduled webinar event will be on Friday, November 20th at 10.30 Eastern USA time. Each of you will be receiving an announcement for the event a few weeks prior. Please help promote these events by encouraging your co colleagues to join in and register. The IWCS International Cable and Connectivity Symposium is the premier global event showcasing new technologies in cable and connectivity products, processes, and applications. Our next scheduled annual conference will take place on Sunday, Wednesday, October 2nd through 5th, 2016 in Providence, Rhode Island. Please visit our website at www.iwcs.org for more event details. In just a moment, you will see a brief survey so that you can provide us your feedback and comments on today's event so that we can further improve this webinar series for you. Thank you all for your participation, and this concludes today's session.